Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 113. Yeltsin begins to make his mark. Last episode, we followed Boris Yeltsin as he went from university life to the top of his world in the Sverdlovsk Oblast as the first secretary of the Communist Party. As much as Yeltsin enjoyed his position, he knew that his oblast in the Urals was small potatoes compared to the kind of power being wielded in the Soviet capital of Moscow. Boris, though, claims, quote, I never had the dream or so much as the wish to work in Moscow. Others remember his ambition a little bit differently. The winds of change were blowing through the Soviet capital, starting with the death of Leonid Brezhnev. Yuri Andropov viewed Yeltsin quite positively, but he also passed away. Konstantin Chernenko slowed down any advancement for Boris, but then he too died quickly after taking office. Then a new and younger man, filled with ideas of reform, came to power, when Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev. At first, the new leader was a little wary of Yeltsin, not sure of what type of man he was. But this was also a two-way street, as Boris wasn't so sure about Gorbachev either. As Colton puts it in his biography of Yeltsin, quote, Stylistically, the two were like oil and water. He continues describing their differences. I just love the way this man describes Yeltsin and his relationship with Gorbachev. And his, I just highly recommend the book on Yeltsin. Uh, quote, Gorbachev was from the sun-drenched plains bordering the Caucasus Mountains, had become a communist in his early 20s, received a law degree at Moscow State University, the oldest and most prestigious university in Russia, made his career in the Komsomol and in general party leadership, and married to a Marxist philosopher. Yeltsin was a half foot taller, athletic, and a full head of hair. Gorbachev was garrulous and even tempered. Yeltsin was spare with words and irascible. Gorbachev's favorite authors were the romantic writer and poet Mikhail Lermontov and Vladimir Mayakovsky, the futurist bard of the Bolshevik Revolution who died a suicide. Yeltsin preferred Chekhov, Pushkin, and Sergei Yesenin, a poet who wrote of love and village life, married five times, including once to Isadora Duncan and who also died by his own hand. In music, Gorbachev's taste ran to symphonies and Italian opera. Yeltsin, it was folk songs and pop tunes. These two men were almost complete opposites, as you can see. Yeltsin believed early on that Gorbachev was over his head as general secretary, because he had it easy when he ran Stavropol, as opposed to the one he ruled over in the tougher region of Sverdlovsk. Boris's oblast had twice the population, and Stavropol was seen as a vacation spot for the higher-ups in the Communist Party, while Sverdlovsk was more of a working region. Still, in 1985, Gorbachev was the first secretary of the Communist Party of the USSR, and he held the power to move Yeltsin from his comfort zone in Sverdlovsk. On April 12, 1985, Yeltsin was made to take on a new job in the Central Committee in the Construction and Capital Investment Department in Moscow. After three months on the job, Gorbachev nominated Yeltsin for the chairman's position, which was approved by the Politburo despite objections from the elderly Nikolai Tikhonov. Now in Moscow, Yeltsin began to impress Gorbachev with his work ethic and style so much that the first secretary nominated Boris to the position of first secretary of the Communist Party of the city of Moscow. Now, in his autobiography, Confession, Yeltsin remembers what he thought and did when he found out about the pending appointment. Quote, for me, this is a bolt out of the blue. I stood up and spoke out about the inappropriateness of such a decision. And also, I did not know cadres so well in Moscow, so it would be difficult for me to work in that position. When Gorbachev pushed him, he remembered, quote, The conversation in the Politburo was not simple for me, 
Again? They said to me that party discipline applied, and they knew better where I would be of the most use to the party. In general, once again puzzling over it, understanding full well that the Moscow party organization could not be left in such a state, and throwing out suggestions as they went about whom it would be better to send there. I agreed. Again, Boris's recall is somewhat different from reality, though. Nowhere do we find any evidence that Yeltsin did anything but become excited at getting the promotion. So take his words with a big grain of salt here. When the nomination of Yeltsin to replace the retiring Viktor Grishin as the first secretary of Moscow was made, the conversation went something like this according to Colton's biography of Yeltsin. Gromyko. It should say in the text of the revolution that Comrade Grishin will be assigned to the group of advisors. Solomensev. That's right. Vortiknov. Yes, it has to be written up like that. Gorbachev. If the comrades have no objections, I am available to take part in the plenum of the Moscow Gorkum of the CPSU. Now, let us talk about who the candidate for the post of Gorkum First Secretary. The question is about the party organization of our capital. This makes it appropriate to recommend for this post someone from the Central Committee who has work experience in a major, major party organization and knows about the economy, science, and culture. There is a suggestion that we recommend B. N. Yeltsin. Vorotnikov. Good idea. Solomensev. Sure. Gorbachev. I have had a conversation with Comrade Yeltsin. He understands the place and significance of the Moscow Party organization, how thorny and complex work as first secretary of the Moscow City Committee would be. The capital, after all, is the capital. It is our administrative, economic, scientific, and cultural center. And population size alone. Moscow is like a real country. Vorotnikov, yes, a country like Czechoslovakia. Gorbachev, do the comrades have any other suggestions? Members of the Politburo? No. Gorbachev, in that case, Comrade Yeltsin, we will be recommending you as first secretary of the Moscow Party Committee. Shortly thereafter, at the next plenum, when Grishin retired and gave a short speech thanking everyone for their treatment of him, Yeltsin accepted his position. As he went on to say, uh, Five and a half months ago, I was elected as secretary of the Central Committee. I exerted every effort to master my new duties. Now I am being given an extraordinary assignment. I shall do all I can in order to participate actively in every innovation taking place in the party and the country, in dealing with the problems Mikhail Sergeyevich has been speaking about. I will try to justify your confidence. Gorbachev replied, We certainly hope so, or else we would not be making such a decision. Uh, do we all approve of the motion? And they all yelled out, We approve. As was common in the Politburo, the vote was unanimous. Moscow was a megalopolis with a population nearing 9 million. As Colton put it, it was Washington, New York, Boston, and Los Angeles all rolled into one. Yeltsin was also stepping into some very big and famous shoes, as others who served in his position included Vyacheslav Molotov, Lazar Kaganovich, and Nikita Khrushchev. In the old Soviet world, Sandra Brezhnev, this would have been the last position for Boris, as it was as cushy as it got. He was also moved up as a candidate member of the Politburo, able to discuss issues, but not quite ready or allowed to vote yet. We've now made it to the year 1986, and Yeltsin was settled into his new position, but not without enemies. Number one among them was someone who knew Boris from Sverdlovsk, and that was Nikolai Ryshkov. He felt that Yeltsin had too big of an ego and was very self-centered. Unfortunately for Rishkov, he was only made a member of the Politburo after Boris had been elected to the job. Gorbachev, Ligachev, 
and Rishkov met where Nikolai was blunt in his assessment of Yeltsin. As Colton put it, quote, some years later, Gorbachev would admit to him that he rued the day he snubbed, snubbed Rishkov's advice about Yeltsin. Another enemy in the wings was one Evgeny Razumov, who knew Boris since 1976. Others had written to the Politburo from the Sverdlovsk Oblast, telling them that they were making a mistake, but no one did anything about it. After a few months on the job, Yeltsin delivered a two-hour report to the Politburo, telling them that the previous administrations had only made the exterior of the city look pretty, all the while ignoring the numerous serious problems. Sitting there, likely seething, was none other than Grecian, who was still a member of the Politburo. He took the beating because, how he put it, quote, this is how we were raised, not to contradict the opinion of the leadership which was where the assertions of the keynote speaker were coming from. On February 26, 1986, at the 27th Congress of the CPSU, Yeltsin began to make his mark on the national stage as he called for major changes to be made, particularly on how the system squashed innovation because of an, quote, inert stratum of time servers with party cards. And the Soviet Union was cursed with a certain infallibility of officialdom. He further went on to say that the structure of the USSR needed change along with periodic accountability, which covered everyone from the general secretary on down. This was a bold and dangerous position to take. When he was questioned about why he didn't say anything five years ago at the last Congress, he simply replied, quote, I can answer and answer sincerely. I did not then have enough courage and political experience. He now had all the courage and experience he needed. He would need both of them in the coming years. No doubt with approval from Gorbachev, Yeltsin decided to clean house and get rid of the leftover apparatchiks from Grecian's time. In a speech on April 11th, Boris made it clear that the times they were a changing. Quote, the city authorities have been playing make-believe. We know what we're doing. Everything is A-plus here. We're the tops in the world. There's no need to wash Moscow's dirty laundry in public. Those who keep on thinking this way should vacate their places and clear out. Quickly thereafter, Yeltsin had the mayor of Moscow, Vladimir Promislov's resignation on his desk. Replacing him was Valery Saikin, former director of the largest auto manufacturer, Zillworks. In less than two years, Yeltsin replaced all of the secretaries of the Gorkin, two-thirds of the rayon first secretaries, and almost all of the leaders from Promislov's administration. Boris brought in younger men with factory experience to run the administration and to carry out his orders. When Saikin laid out plans to provide apartments for every citizen in Moscow by the year 2000, along with an expansion of the subway system, Yeltsin crossed out the date and changed it to 1995 and dramatically increased the projected expansion of the subway. Saikin was shocked. As he did in Sverdlovsk, Boris was taking the proverbial bull by the horns and ramrodding his plans into action. But he was just getting started. Yeltsin knew in his heart that the whole Soviet system was one bureaucratic mess. The nomenklatura culture was corrupt. He traveled throughout the city, uncovering corruption and talking to the common folk, asking them to tell him where the problem areas were. In the newspaper, Moskovskaya Pravda, the editor, Mikhail Poltoranin, ordered exposés to be published uncovering the unspoken issue of how the nomenclatura class was taking benefits of their position to an extreme. He uncovered all the luxuries that the apparatchiks were giving themselves, all the while the common people were standing in line for sugar and bread. This was an era of glasnost and perestroika, and Yeltsin was taking the openness to an extreme. This made him a darling of the journalists, who were now allowed to tell the truth, and not to be as monitored as they had been in the past. Vladimir Mezentsev, a reporter from the main television station, 
Ostankino, gushed over Yeltsin. He was saying words no one was then saying about the canonized Komsomol, and by extension, about the party. He was saying that they didn't let me say at Ostankino. He was speaking for all of us who wept at the hypocrisies of the communist way of life. Yeltsin's harsh way of talking and actions were making enemies all over, but he explained why he did it. Quote, In Moscow, there was no alternative. This is a bewildering city. I had a difficult legacy to deal with. And you have to take into account that all of us who today are over 50 grew up in the time of administrative command methods. You can't get away from this. Thus far, we have no other methods. We educate ourselves and try to find something different, but it all goes very slowly. When I worked in the Gorkum, 90% of the problems that arose had to be dealt with immediately and decisively. The situation demanded it. Moscow was in a tizzy, as it was not only the most intellectual city in the Soviet Union, making it very reform-minded, it was also the city with the most conservative elements of the government. The hardliners were bristling against all of the changes. As Gorbachev was to remember, it was not easy to work in Moscow, and Yeltsin felt likely more acutely than others the resistance of the party and economic nomenclatura to perestroika. Yeltsin happened upon obstacles that in Sverdlovsk he did not suspect existed. What began to disturb Boris was the pushback on his reforms, and it was, and to his real shock, the pushback he was getting from the man who started Glasnost and Perestroika, Mikhail Gorbachev. But one of the reasons that their relationship began to fray was Riza, Mikhail's wife. She had begun to involve herself in politics, especially the local variety, and nudge her way into some of the projects in Moscow, like the creating of a project that would change the gum department store into a museum, much to the dismay of Yeltsin and Mayor Saikin. Both men appealed to the general secretary to stop the project. What they found instead was an angry husband who would not hear of it. When, in 1989, Yeltsin was asked by the U.S. ambassador whether he would bring his wife Nina Yeltsina to America with him, Boris shouted, No, absolutely not. I'll not have her acting like Riza Maximovna. The tension between the two men began to grow. Vitaly Tretyakov remembered that Yeltsin's aggressiveness was irritating Gorbachev. Quote, At first it was a positive, constructive aggressiveness, the wish to do what had seemed to him Gorbachev expected, and to do it better and faster than the others. But when it came to light that the general secretary did not view Zel Yeltsin's zeal and shock workness with gratitude. Yeltsin took a turn toward an aggressiveness that was destructive of the power of the leader of Perestroika. Boris felt that Gorbachev was beginning to waver on his plans for reform. As he put it, you could not talk of any democracy in the Politburo. After the general secretary's preamble, Everybody was supposed to get up and read from a little card, Hooray, I agree with everything. For his part, Gorbachev began to put clamps on Yeltsin, such as ordering the editor of Pravda to stop covering of Boris in the press. On top of that, three people with equal or less time on the Politburo leapfrogged over Yeltsin, becoming full voting members of the leadership committee, leaving Boris in his non-voting post. Yeltsin, by this time, had had enough. He called for a democratization of all spheres of life. Gorbachev was infuriated. He said, We cannot break the knees of the party and society. We need to speak respectfully about party members who have been carrying and will carry the load and who are experiencing losses. They may have weaknesses, but they have strengths too. The rebuke by Gorbachev shook Yeltsin. During a Politburo meeting, the general secretary reiterated his dress down of Boris. Quote, Let us not over-dramatize, but this kind of conversation has been good for Boris Nikolaevich's practical work. 
He cannot be immune to the criticism that he calls on all of us to make. Elson replied, I'm a novice on the Politburo. For me, this has been a lesson. I don't think it came too late. And Gorbachev said, You and I already had words on this subject. By all means, take the lesson to heart. This conversation has been necessary. But you are an emotional person. I don't think your observations will change our attitude towards you. We have a high opinion of your work. Just remember that we have to work together. You are not to set yourself or show off in front of your comrades. Another element, enemy that Yeltsin had made was Yegor Ligachev, Gorbachev's second-in-command. They sniped at each other with Ligachev often coming out on top because of his higher position. While Yeltsin tried to make decisions such as how to control protests in local hands, Ligachev, true to his central authoritarian mindset, scoffed at the idea. Boris by this time was so infuriated with the situation that he wrote a resignation letter to Gorbachev on September 12, 1987. Mikhail Sergeyevich was troubled by the letter, but wanted to put off a decision until November. Ligachev, though, he was working on the sidelines, gathering up dirt on Yeltsin to spring at him at the next plenum meeting. At the October plenum meeting, Yeltsin got up, gave a short rambling speech blasting the system and the entrenched members of the nomenclatura culture, and sat down to listen to four hours of blistering criticism of him. On November 9th, Yeltsin, having a nervous breakdown, slashed himself in the rib cage with scissors, which caused him to be hospitalized. On the 11th, Gorbachev ordered him to a meeting to be reprimanded yet again. They were beating a man who was already beaten down. By February of 1988, just two years after being elevated to his position on the Politburo, he was stripped of his position. Join me next time when I recount the amazing rebirth, the political rebirth, of Boris Yeltsin, an event that was just remarkable and totally unexpected. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to go to the website at www.russianrulershistory.com where I'm recounting the best and the worst of the Russian rulers. And if you have an inclination, you can make a donation on the page. It would be greatly appreciated to help pay for this podcast and all the research materials that go with it. But also, come on over to Facebook where you can grow, join our growing family of Russian history lovers at the Russian Rulers History page where you can ask a question, leave a comment, or make a suggestion. So now, as always, das vidanya, и спасибо большое.